Good morning. September 11th, 2002. One year after the worst terrorist attack in history. The World Trade Center. The Pentagon. A field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. It was a day that began like any other and ended in horror and disbelief. This will be a day of solemn ceremony, a time to grieve the losses, a time to honor the heroes, a time to remember what happened one year ago today, Wednesday, September the 11th, 2002. From NBC News, this is a special edition of Today, America Remembers, with Katie Couric and Matt Lauer. And welcome to Today on this sad and somber Wednesday morning. I'm Katie Couric at what is now known and will be forever as Ground Zero. This was once a shining symbol of America's spirit, ambitious, and ingenuity, the shining towers of the Twin Towers here at the World Trade Center, but now it is a 16-acre scar, and the healing process for thousands of families and the entire nation is far from over. And I'm Matt Lauer, uptown in Studio 1A. The attack on America took this country by surprise. By now, the images have grown familiar, but the idea of it, a coordinated assault, four airliners hijacked and turned into missiles, innocent Americans used to attack other Americans is still quite stunning. One year ago, the events were already unfolding. By 7.02, Mohammed Atta, the leader of the hijackers, was on board a U.S. Airways flight from Maine to Boston. He spent that entire flight praying. Today, we remember what the terrorists wrought. At Ground Zero, where the names of the victims will be read aloud. At the Pentagon, where President Bush will honor those lost and in Pennsylvania, where they'll pay tribute to the heroes of Flight 93. Today, we will hear from our leaders and some ordinary Americans who were moved to extraordinary acts. From the White House, where the president will observe a moment of silence to mark the time that the first plane hit the first tower, to our fighting men and women in Afghanistan, who are taking part in Operation Enduring Freedom, Katie. Matt, meanwhile, families are beginning to gather here, not only families, but representatives as well from the NYPD, the FDNY, the Port Authority. Bagpipers marching from each of the five boroughs will be arriving here at Ground Zero. Some of them left as early as midnight last night. This clearly will be a day of remembrance, resilience, and resolve. Meanwhile, on Tuesday, as you know, the federal government raised the nation's terror alert warning to its second highest level, which is called Code Orange, signaling a high risk of attack. NBC's justice correspondent Pete Williams is at FBI headquarters with, with more on this. Pete, good morning. Katie, good morning to you. There were several factors that led the government to do this. First, a captured Al-Qaeda operative in Southeast Asia warned of multiple simultaneous attacks on U.S. interests overseas and said Al-Qaeda cells had been gathering explosives for car bombs to do this since January of this year. Then another source warned of possible suicide attacks on U.S. interests in the Middle East. Intelligence analysts also worried that low-level Al-Qaeda operatives might try to stage individualized, undirected attacks of their own. And then intelligence analysts also noted that the kind of intelligence traffic that they follow looked very similar to the pattern of, of uh, intelligence traffic that led up to September 11th. Put that all together, add an additional concern that officials thought, well, if there's all this, perhaps there's other parts of it that we don't know about that might target the United States, and they decided to increase the threat level. But so far, the only specific and credible reports they have of possible attacks are on interests overseas, and that's why the State Department has closed 14 embassies. U.S. military forces are on their highest state of alert in the Middle East, short of war. There is extra security around the world at installations, Katie. All right. Pete Williams, Pete, thank you very much. New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg planned and will lead the ceremony here at Ground Zero this morning. Mr. Mayor, good morning to you. You know, as you set out to plan this event, this very important event, really, for so many people and the entire nation, what was your major goal? Well, I thought we had two things to do. 
One was to look back and remember those 2,800 people that were lost and understand why they were lost and tell the world that story. And the other thing is to look forward and tell the world that we are in the process of rebuilding and New York and America and freedom will wind up better than it was a year ago. How involved were the families in the planning of the ceremony? Some very, some just didn't want to get involved at all. We tried to outreach to as many different groups as we could. Uh, and in the end, you take a little bit of everybody's ideas and you blend them together and come up with something. There will be a citywide moment of silence at 846, the time the first plane hit the North Tower. Uh, there will be some very moving silences, frankly, during this ceremony, but you made the decision not to have any original speeches. The Gettysburg Address will be read, the Declaration of Independence, later going to be reading the Four Freedoms, written by Franklin D. Roosevelt. Why that decision? Because some people might say, Mr. Mayor, you know, we need, a, we need words to help us heal. We need relevant words to put this into context and give us some understanding. I think that the attack on the World Trade Center was attack, an attack on freedom-loving people around the world. And uh, what better than the basis on which this country was formed, the Declaration of Independence, the most tragic period in our history, our Civil War remembrance, or uh, World War II, which really was a defining moment, and FDR took us out of the Depression. The president will, as the leader of the country and really of the free world, will tonight give a speech taking us forward. And I thought it was appropriate for him to do that and us to pull together America in the morning. Meanwhile, the nation, including New York City, are under uh, a code orange alert, which is the second to the highest, a state of high alert. Obviously, New Yorkers are nervous today. How can you assure them that all the proper precautions have been taken? New York has been under code orange for the whole year. We never reduced our uh, standard of readiness after the attack a year ago. So it hasn't been enhanced at all for the one-year anniversary? We, well, we obviously have more police officers both on the street where you see them and where you do not see them and are taking extra precautions on 9-11. But we have the world's best police department. We've been training extensively for this. And I think from an individual point of view, what we should do as human beings, hug our loved ones one more time before we leave in the morning, a little extra kiss and squeeze, uh, take some time at 846 to remember those we left behind, light a candle tonight, exercise some common sense. If you see something strange, call 911, but leave security to the professionals. I'm very comfortable with that. All right. New York City Mayor Michael Bloomberg, as always. Mr. Mayor, thanks very much for Thank talking with much, us. Yeah. Good luck today. I know it's going to be a difficult day for everyone. Now, here's Matt. All right, Katie, thank you. Former Mayor Rudy Giuliani led New York through the darkest day in its history, and of course, the aftermath. Mayor Giuliani, good morning to you. Good morning, Matt. L let me start by first expressing my condolences to you and your family. I know your mother passed away a few days ago. How's your family doing? My family is doing all right. I mean, we, uh, she had a long life, uh, almost 93 years. We buried her yesterday, and uh, you can't, you can't uh, help but uh, you know, compare it to all of those people who lost loved ones in the midst of their life and so we have a lot to be very thankful for well again our condolences it's been a year Thank you. since since the unthinkable happened in this city mr mayor what are your thoughts on this morning my thoughts are that the city is here uh, very much like the thoughts i had when i woke up on the morning of september 12th after about 45 minutes sleep the city is here it is very strong it's going to have to endure uh, this pain because it is a tremendous amount of pain because we know the people that we lost on the way in here this morning I saw a man who lost his son and we hugged uh, but uh, we're stronger for it we're stronger for it because we we survived it and we understand how important uh, the things we're fighting for are you know th there's going to come a, co a time this morning Mayor Giuliani where you'll take part in this ceremony at Ground Zero and you'll begin to read the names of the people who were lost on that day do you expect that to be a very difficult time for you yeah, I, I have expected for some time this to be a very difficult day. And I guess like many people, I'm uh, ho hoping, you know, that we're over it and we're into tomorrow, but it's a necessary day. It's a day in which we remember the awesome bravery of the people who uh, displayed more bravery in the face of evil uh, than I've ever seen before, who conducted the very best rescue operation 
in the history of this country, saving over 25,000 people. I'll never forget, Matt, when I fell down here that morning and I, I went to the fire department command post and things were falling down around us. And uh, then uh, we had to face uh, what happened. If you had asked me how many people we would have lost, it could easily have been three or four times more. I think you said that no day, you said, you said the number of dead will be more than any of us can bear. Yeah, well, it was more than we could bear. But at the time, at the time we thought it was even more. And the re reason that it wasn't as high as it could have been is because these brave people saved so many people, saved over 20 or 25,000 people. And in, and in the weeks after that, we recognized that. And somehow, you know, as, you, as time moves away, we don't realize the most horrible, horrific attack in the history of this country, the worst losses we've ever sustained, and the bravest response on the part of uniformed services and other people that we've ever witnessed in any, uh, you know, four, five, six hour period. You know, as I get back to you reading the names of those who died, there's a good chance you'll be reading the names of people whose funerals you attended. Uh, yeah, names that I've either, either knew or then got to know in the months after that. Uh, you know, when I was at my mother's funeral yesterday, I was there with uh, Governor Pataki and the former police commissioner, fire commissioner, head of emergency services, Governor uh, Carey, and uh, we remarked how we've, you know, we've spent a year being at funerals together. And, uh, but it gave us strength. Every, every one of those funerals gave me strength. It gave me the determination, you know, to move on, to move on with life, and to uh, remain committed to the absolute goal of ending global terrorism. And, and, and on this morning, is there one message you'd like to convey to the families who lost loved ones on that terrible day? We love them. Uh, they share this loss you know, with so many people that maybe that can give them uh, some sense of solace and strength and the pride they should feel, even, uh, even feeling the loss and with the tears in their eyes, the pride they should feel about the remarkable heroism of these people who turned the worst attack in America into one of our greatest days and to a day of great patriotism. Former New York City Mayor Rudolph Giuliani. Mr. Mayor, again, our thoughts are with Thank your you, family Mayor. on this day. Thank you. As the city of New York and the nation get ready to mark this somber day, we want to take a look, a moment to look back at the chilling events as they unfolded one year ago today. It's the 11th day of September 2001. Surveillance cameras at the airport in Portland, Maine caught these images of the hijackers. American Airlines flight number 11 from Boston's Logan Airport, scheduled to go to LAX. It left at 8 a.m. this morning. We have a report the plane may have flown out of Newark, New Jersey. American Flight 77, a 757 with 64 aboard. Back in Boston, United Flight 175 with 65 aboard. Al, it is such a pretty morning, it isn't is it? Perfect fall morning. Yeah. It is the West Twin Tower. Oh, another one just hit. Something else just hit. A very large plane just oh. flew directly over my building, and there's been another collision. A second airplane, a 727, just ran into the building. Two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. There was an explosion of some kind here at the Pentagon. They are now confirming that it does appear that at the Pentagon it was a plane. The FAA has banned all takeoffs at all airports across America. The building has collapsed. That tower just came down. These pictures are beyond belief. We now have an AP news alert out of Pittsburgh, the crash of a large plane just north of the airport. The other tower of the World Trade Center has just collapsed. There's been a declaration of war by terrorists in the United States. We need all of the open space we can get to evacuate people from the World Trade Center. It's about the year in combat. I never saw anything like this. Nothing this devastating. Our military at home and around the world is on high alert status. A third damaged building, the 40-story World Trade Center number seven, also crashes to the ground. I've directed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to find those responsible and to bring them to justice. America has been attacked 
and it has been changed. September 11th, 2001. We now want to check in with our correspondents stationed across the country. Jim Miklaszewski is at his post at the Pentagon as he was one year ago today. Robert Hager is at Reagan National Airport. Brian Williams is covering Homeland Security and Kelly O'Donnell is in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Mick, let's start with you. Katie, there are several indications today that the war in Afghanistan, indeed the war on terrorism, is far from over. In Afghanistan today, 9,500 U.S. troops. That's the largest number of American troops in Afghanistan since last October when the war began. Now, the war took a terrible toll on the U.S. military, 51 dead, 19 of those killed in actual combat. There were thousands of enemy forces killed, uh, and uh, but only just a handful of the top leaders of either al-Qaeda or Taliban captured, and the number one target, Osama bin Laden, remains elusive today. And if you really want a good sign of where the war on terrorism stands today, U.S. military forces throughout the Persian Gulf, Southwest Asia, and the Middle East are at the highest state of alert this morning, just short of war. And there's one more telling sign right here in Washington, D.C. Just 100 yards from where I sit right now, a live anti-aircraft missile battery guards Washington, D.C. Katie. Jim McLeishevsky at the Pentagon. Mick, thank you very much. Of course, we'll have the memorial ceremony live there a little bit later, as well as the remarks by President Bush. Meanwhile, after the attacks of September 11th, air traffic in the United States was grounded, and the airline industry has yet to recover. NBC's Robert Hager is at Reagan National Airport with more on that aspect of the story. Bob, good morning. Morning, Katie. Well, you can really see that here this morning because uh, the crowd is very, very light. There's almost no weight at all in the ticket line there behind me. Uh, the morning shuttles have gone out from this airport to New York and Boston, half empty. And that's what's expected at airports across the country this morning. A lot of travelers wary already about traveling this day and even more wary with that new alert. All the airlines have canceled a lot of flights today. I know U.S. Air told me they'd canceled more than 100. Among all the airlines, about 13 percent fewer flights nationwide than on a normal Wednesday this time of year. Advanced reservations today down 22 percent, says the online booking site Orbitz. Security heightened some because of uh, yesterday's alert. For instance, uh, even more of those uh, air marshals are flying today. The force is 100% deployed. Uh, we've got military exercises here in Washington and in New York that put fighter planes in the air once again. And there are some flying restrictions uh, as those memorial services uh, go on today. A different sort of travel day one year after that horrible day a year ago. Katie. Bob Hager at Reagan National Airport. Bob, thanks so much. We'll be checking in with you throughout the morning. Meanwhile, NBC's Brian Williams is covering Homeland Security. He joins us from MSNBC headquarters with more on that. Brian, good morning. Good morning to you, Katie. And despite this new elevated threat level, which included, by the way, the rather chilling admonition from the feds that families across the country should talk about this day, its significance as an event, even know how to contact each other throughout the day, it appears the business of this Wednesday morning goes on. Uh, we're going to take advantage of some software called Flight Explorer vis-a-vis -vis what Bob Hager just reported and take a look at where the various commercial aircraft are located. This every dot represents a plane in the sky over the United States right now. And while this is not the volume you would see on an average Wednesday, this pattern is very familiar. Most of the dots in the East Coast there are the 6 and 7 a.m. departures, most of them headed west, and we will start to see the area around O'Hare come to life and the area outside LAX come to life as the morning goes on. Schedules reduced about 13 percent officially, but remembering that all the major East Coast landmarks are being protected by either missiles or F-15s or F-16s aloft, it's still a good amount of business in the skies over the United States. Katie, we'll check on and out through the day. All right, Brian William Williams, Brian, thank you so much. In Somerset County, Pennsylvania, 40 people were killed when United Flight 93 plunged into a field after a desperate struggle. NBC's Kelly O'Donnell is there as family members and friends mark this day. Kelly, good morning. 
Good morning, Katie. Shanksville shares this anniversary with New York and Washington, but things here have always been different. For example, President Bush will make his very first visit to the site today. He and the First Lady will visit the Shanksville site and will place a wreath here before about 500 family members who are gathered just a short distance away. They are the family members of the 40 passengers and crew who were involved in that heroic struggle. Also different about Shanksville, unlike New York, unlike the Pentagon, this place was never a target. It has been described as a battleground that became a cemetery. Also, unlike the Pentagon, where rebuilding has already taken place, and unlike New York, where there is so much debate over what to do with the site, here in Shanksville, there is very little debate. They believe this land will remain a hallowed ground. Plans for a permanent memorial are underway, but the place where the crash took place will remain just as it is today, a peaceful field. Katie? All right, Kelly O'Donnell in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Kelly, thank you very much. Now let's go back to Studio 1A to the news desk where Ann Curry has a look at the other news of this day. And good morning. Good morning, Katie, and thank you. Good morning, everybody. In other news this morning, still no official winner in Florida's Democratic race for governor near, with nearly all the votes counted. Former Attorney General Janet Reno is trailing Bill McBride with 43 percent to his 45 percent of the vote. There were ballot problems in Florida on Tuesday, even though it revamped its election system after the 2000 presidential recount. On Tuesday, thousands of ballots were not counted and others went missing. Among other key races on Tuesday, two-term New Hampshire Senator Bob Smith lost in his Republican primary against Representative John Sununu, and Elizabeth Dole won her Republican primary for Jesse Helms' Senate seat in North Carolina. Today, U.N. Secretary General Kofi Annan warned the U.S. not to take any unilateral military action against Iraq. He said any steps must be sanctioned by the Security Council. President Bush addresses the U.N. tomorrow. Lawyers for Martha Stewart say they welcome the decision by House lawmakers to turn their investigation over to the Justice Department. Lawmakers decided not to subpoena her to testify before their committee. Instead, they want federal prosecutors to investigate whether she misled them about her sale of stock in Imclone. And this 9-11 anniversary is being marked not just in the United States, but overseas as well. Last night, two powerful beams of light were projected into the night sky over Paris to honor the victims and to express solidarity with the United States. And in Australia this morning, hundreds of people, including firefighters, wearing red, white, and blue shirts, gathered on a beach to form a giant U.S. flag. NBC News will have day-long coverage of today's 9-11 tributes, and you can follow also the events along throughout this day on msnbc.com. It is now 7.22. Let's now turn back to Matt. Matt, nice to see these gestures from overseas. It certainly is, Anne. Thanks very much. Let's find out what the weather is going to be like for the memorial services all across the country. Al's outside with a check of the weather. Al? That's right. A warm, humid day here in the Northeast, Matt. Let's take a look, show you what's going on. We've got Gustav right now, and you can see a lot of rain stretching from Nantucket just off the shoreline of New Jersey in Long Island, 240 miles south-southwest of Nantucket with 70 mile per hour winds, heavy surf and rip currents possible. Windy in the northeast as a cold front moves through, sunshine in the northwest, a lot of rain in the southwest where there are flash flood watches up for the Four Corners areas, fog in central coastal California, and scattered showers and thunderstorms along the central and southern Florida peninsula. That's what's going on around the country. Here's what's happening in your neck of the woods. That's your latest weather now back inside the map. All right, Al, thank you very much. Much more ahead of this special edition of today as America remembers right after this. Matt, the outpouring for those who were killed in the attacks here at the World Trade Center really have been overwhelming. Here's just one small example. Homeless children at the Thomas Pappas Elementary School in Phoenix raised $2,000 by selling paper flags and, of course, all that money they sent to New York City. What a moving sight, Katie, overnight as those bagpipers moved through the five boroughs of Manhattan or New York heading toward ground zero for the ceremonies that will take place a little more than an hour from now. Members of the fire department, sanitation department, Port Authority police and police department honoring those they lost a year ago today. We'll be right back after your local news. I've never seen any, it looks like a movie. I saw a large plane, like a jet, go immediately headed directly into the World Trade Center. It, it, it just flew into it, into the, into the other tower coming from south to north. I watched the plane fly into the World Trade Center. 
This is a special edition of Today, America Remembers, September 11th, 2002. I'm Matt Lauer in Studio 1A in Midtown Manhattan. Katie, that was Jennifer Oberstein on the phone with us back at 9.04 on September 11th, 2001. And, and listening to it this morning, it is chilling to hear. And we're going to check in with Jennifer a little bit later on this morning, Katie. Matt, that's right. It really is chilling to hear the, the frantic nature of her voice when she was uh, recounting what she was seeing that terrible morning. For many people, the rituals and ceremony of this one-year anniversary will provide significant solace, but for others, it's a day that they've dreaded for some time. All the images replayed, all the wounds of grief reopened. Families of all types are still reeling from the attacks. The youngest victim was two-year-old Christine Hansen. She was on United Airlines Flight 175 on her way to Disneyland for the first time. The oldest victim, 82-year-old Robert Norton, who was on American Airlines Flight 11. And Katie, let me give you an idea of what we can expect to see throughout the day. President Bush has designated today Patriot Day. Flags across the country are flying at half staff. President and Mrs. Bush are leaving the White House to attend a private church service. And one year ago, the president was at the Emma E. Booker Elementary School in Sarasota, Florida. He was preparing to talk to school children when he first got word of the attack. Today will be a very different day for the president. After church and a moment of silence at the White House at 8.46, the exact time the first plane hit the first tower, he and Mrs. Bush will make their way to the Pentagon, where Mr. Bush will deliver remarks at a ceremony there. The Bushes will then travel to Shanksville, Pennsylvania, to lay a wreath on the field where Flight 93 slammed into the ground, killing all 40 people on board after what's been described as a fierce struggle. President Bush will then move on to New York City, where he and Mrs. Bush will lay a wreath at Ground Zero. And tonight, he'll address the nation from New York, Katie. Meanwhile, Matt, in a moment, we're going to be talking with some of the family members who are dealing with ex this extremely difficult anniversary. We're going to find out how they're coping, why many are participating in this ceremony at Ground Zero, and why so many, Matt, are staying away, preferring to recognize this day privately with their loved ones. So look at the spiritual impact of the day from Cardinal Edward Egan, the leader of the Catholic Church here in New York. And just to give you a sense of our timeline one year ago, at this very time a year ago, American Airlines Flight 77 began boarding passengers at Washington's Dulles Airport. Now let's get a check of the weather across the nation from Al. Al, good morning again. Thank you very much, Matt. We're out here with a lot of uh, folks wearing patriotic colors. We also have uh, a gentleman, Samuel Holliday, who was one of the original uh, wind talkers. From, uh, code talkers. Code talkers, I'm sorry, from, uh, from the Navajo Nation. Yeah, and, and you're here today, and we appreciate the, the work you did so many years ago. Thank you so very much. And what's your name? Helena. This Helena. is my father. Oh, thank you very my much. My best friend, Janet. Great. It's really <laughs> great. And what is Yahati? Yahate means hello in Navajo. All right. So how would you say today in Navajo? Uh, DJ. DJ? Uh -huh. So this is the DJ show. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you yeah. very much. Well, we appreciate you coming down. Thank you very much, sir. Very much. All right. Thank let's you. check your weather, see what's going on. And we'll show you the heat in the south. The dog day still hanging around as we work our way into September. Mobile, Alabama, 95. Augusta, 97. Waco, Texas, 98. Again, we've got Gustav off the uh, northeast coast, bringing a lot of rain to northern New England. Uh, monsoonal moisture in the southwest with rain all the way up into Montana. Sunshine in the northwest with 77 degrees, sunny skies in Seattle today. That's what's going on around the country. Here's what's happening in your neck of the woods. It's your latest weather now back to ground zero and Kate. All right, Al, thank you very much. You know, some families have chosen to stay away from ground zero in the ceremony here, but many are gathering for the commemoration. Tom Roger's daughter, Jean, was a flight attendant on American Airlines Flight 11, the first plane to hit the towers. He is vice president of families of September 11th. Christy Ferrer's husband, Neil Levin, was the executive director of the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. Neil died at the World Trade Center. Christy serves as Mayor Bloomberg's liaison with the families of those killed. Tom and Christy, good morning. I'm so happy to see you all here. I know it's a really difficult day, but we really appreciate your joining us. You all are here sort of really in an official capacity because you're not only grieving the loss of your loved ones, but you've really helped so many other families as well, yet on a personal level. I'm sure you're thinking of your daughter today. Absolutely, Katie. It's uh, an emotional time, you know, for us, uh, our whole family is here today. And, you know, I, 
because last year, you know, it's been a very difficult time for everyone. You know, certainly the remorse and the recovery effort and, you know, and all the efforts of the country to try to put things right. You know, we're hoping at least for some of us that uh, this can, today can mark a new beginning in this whole process. Tell me a little about your daughter, Jeannie. So young, so vibrant, so much yes. of her life ahead of her. Yes, my daughter was, uh, my only daughter, uh, was a wonderful young woman, you know, very attractive. Uh, you can see the picture uh, of uh, she and I, that was actually before a millennium party a few years ago, and you know, we had a terrific time, and and you know she uh, she was not supposed to be on that plane, but um, you know we understand she got on that plane with a smile on her face. Christy, Neil was such an outstanding person. Um, tell me what you would like people to know about your husband, Neil Levin. He was an uncompromisingly uh, honest person, a dedicated public servant, and he took time for people. He took time. I mean, you know that, Katie. You knew him. He took time. He took time to pat you know, a doorman, a driver, shake their hand. He's just, um, you know, an extremely magnanimous individual. As I mentioned, Christy, anniversaries are very tough. They really do reopen the wounds of loss and grief. Are you dreading this day, or what are you hoping to get out of this day? I don't want to speak for everybody, but I think there's a large number of us that can't wait for this day to be over. As Janis Joplin said in some bastardized form of it, tomorrow is the first day of our life. <laughs> it's a, a new life tomorrow. I mean, I think after one year, we really have to begin the healing process. And it's kind of up to the victims' families who have a lot of moral authority in what's going on here to say to the nation, OK, let's heal and let's heal together. You've been communicating with so many of the victims' families. I've heard such incredibly complimentary things about both of you and how helpful you've been and how heroic you've been in sort of being selfless and helping them. But what is the biggest concern and, and the biggest issue facing these families, Christy? Staying, staying together in terms of trying to cooperate with the rest of the stakeholders and what's going to go on down here. How many acres are going to be devoted to the memorial? It's not quantity, it's quality. And trying to come together in something that is going to memorialize our loved ones, but at the same time allow this to be a neighborhood. That's the task that's before us, to listen to the other stakeholders and at the same time satisfy our needs. But how do you do that with 2,801 victims taken here at the World Trade Center and on those planes? How can you possibly please everyone? And what are your thoughts of what ultimately you would like to see here, Tom? Well, uh, I personally uh, accept the fact that there needs to be a mixed use development here, but the memorial is should be the most important part of the process. And that anything that goes here really needs to speak to the memorial. So when you're on this site, the 16 acres, you know that you are within the World Trade Center memorial site, whether it's uh, next year or 100 years from now. Rudy Giuliani wants the whole 16 acre site to be just a memorial. Do you understand or do you recognize or do you accept, Christy, the need to have some kind of commercial area or do you agree with the former mayor? You know, it's, it's difficult to say, but I, in my heart, uh, my background is city planning, and I understand the need for mixed use. And I think it may be unrealistic for the plans that Mayor Bloomberg has for Lower Manhattan to think of this entire area as a 16-acre park. And I, I do believe there has to be some mixed use. I don't know whether it's commercial. It could be housing. It could be some business. It could be some respectable use of commercial. It could be a museum dedicated to the memorial. And very quickly, I know one of the bones of contention in the aftermath of this has been the Victims' Compensation Fund, the feeling that it's arbitrary and unfair. Are you all confident that those issues are being settled vis-a-vis -vis how much money is being allocated to each family? It seems to be working itself out. You know, certainly uh, most of the families seem to be uh, uh, standing back and watching the process work, and, and Mr. Feinberg is, is certainly uh, speaking everywhere he can about the the uh, advantages of the process, and I 
I'm optimistic that uh, that will probably end up being the best situation for the families. Also, I just want to say one thing about that. Most of these families haven't even focused on money unless they're in dire need, and they've turned to 9-11 United Services, which has done an enormously fabulous job of helping these families out. A lot of these families have even, haven't even thought about what they're going to do about compensating for their loss of income. I mean, it's just big now. They're not, a lot of them aren't focused on it. Christy Ferrer and Tom Roger, thank you both so much. You know, we'll spend the day thinking of people like your husband, Neil, and your daughter, Jeannie. Thank you. I know what a tough day this is going to be, but we'll be thinking about you, too, as well. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Now back to Matt. All right, Katie, thank you very much. A year ago, New York's bravest and finest suffered great losses. 23 members of the NYPD didn't make it, and a staggering 343 members of the Fire Department of New York City died at the World Trade Center. On September 11, 2001, more firefighters died that had been killed in the whole 50 years before. From the earliest moments, the firefighters were there. The firemen were phenomenal, phenomenal. They're true heroes. They were there. They went back in over and over again. I guess it was about the 27th floor. The firemen started coming up into the building. You know, we were kind of clapping for them and wishing them luck on on their way in. But soon reality hit. Many who went in would never come out. I've never seen anything like it. It's, uh, it's one of the worst things I've ever seen in my life. We've got um, over 300 people that are missing that uh, we can't account for. We believe that many of, uh, many of them are, um, are, are, are gone. Firefighters found comfort in each other and over the months continued searching for their fallen brothers. It hurts so much inside right now and our main goal is just to try to get every person, every brother, every civilian out of that building right now and let them rest in peace. One of the first bodies recovered was that of Father Michael Judge, the firefighter's chaplain. Michael's death, uh, you know, really left a, a void in a lot of people's lives. The fire department alone had 148 funerals in the six months after September 11th. It's just, uh, it's a devastating thing. I don't, I don't know, uh, well, the fire department will, will recover, but I don't know how. New York's bravest and finest faced the reality that they were only human heroes, not superheroes. In a conversation with one of the firefighters, uh, I said, well, now you can no longer hide from your spouse the real dangers of, of your work. And he responded, yes, that's true. And, and we can no longer hide from ourselves anymore the true danger that we face. Nicholas Scapetta is New York City's fire commissioner. He's been working on rebuilding the department since he took office in December. Commissioner Scapetta, good morning to you. Good morning. 343 firefighters died on September 11th. If you look at it in another way, that's 4,400 years of firefighting experience. How do you go about replacing that? Well, uh, we've worked hard at that. Uh, we've hired over 1,200 new firefighters. Uh, we've promoted almost 700 uh, superior officers. We've almost doubled the number of staff chiefs, the senior chiefs in the department. Um, and uh, that's beginning to address that uh, terrible loss. Has September 11th inspired younger people to join the fire department, or are you seeing the opposite effect? People saying they don't want a part of that life. Well, I don't think people are saying that, uh, but uh, this year we had uh, more than a three-month application period. We usually have three or four weeks. We're in the last month of that period, so we're expecting a surge. Uh, as it is, we have a little over 7,000 applications uh, in the department now, and uh, I think we're going to be okay. Uh, but um, any attention you can give to what a wonderful job this is and uh, the great benefits and the need that we have, uh, we'd be delighted to get it. I, I know a lot of firefighters have been complaining about a respiratory disability that they're now suffering as a result of their work in the clearing of ground zero. How concerned are you for the long-term health of your firefighters? Uh, that is my main concern, uh, the emotional and physical well-being uh, of our firefighters, because that's what makes this a unique department. It's the people. Uh, we replaced equipment, we hired new people, we have new uh, strategies, uh, new uh, communication system, uh, new planning, uh, but that is uh, meaningless uh, unless we get the force back to where it was before September 11th. What is the biggest change in the mood of the fire department these days, Commissioner? 
Well, uh, there's an overlay of sadness and mourning that is still very much with us. And of course, today uh, has resurrected all those feelings. Uh, but it's still a very strong department. It's a department rich in tradition and history. Um, and we're going to be all right. It's going to take some time. New York City Fire Commissioner Nicholas Scapetta. Commissioner, thanks very much for your time. Our thoughts are with you today. Thank you very much. And now back to Katie. All right, Matt, thank you. On Tuesday morning, September 11th, two brothers from Manhasset, New York, Ten Dennis and Timothy Coglin, went to work at the World Trade Center. But tragically, only Dennis made it home that day. Timothy, who was a senior managing director for Cantor Fitzgerald Securities, did not. His office was on the 105th floor of the North Tower. One year later, Timmy's wife, Maura, and his two brothers, Dennis and Frank, have come here to pay tribute to the person they love so much. Good morning to all of you. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Maura, what are your thoughts as you approach this very difficult day? Well, I've spent the, the last couple weeks, obviously, uh, not really believing that it's, it's been a year. I've, uh, it's been a year without Timmy. And um, last year, had you told me that I would make it through this year. It would. I don't know if I'd believe it. And uh, it's just, it's been a hard year without him. And I think a lot in terms of my children and, and how they've changed in the last year and how they've grown and and what he's missed. And um, that's certainly very sad. You have three children. Ryan was just four and a half at the time of Timmy's death. Sean was almost three, and Riley was just seven months old. Mm -hmm. I know that you've worked so hard, Maura, to make sure that your husband's memory is kept alive, haven't you? I have, and, and uh, actually, if you had known Timmy, that it's been pretty easy. I mean, in, in such a short time with the kids, he, he had a huge impact on their lives, and they've really done a very good job of, of keeping him alive themselves. I, I mean, I certainly, we talk about him and, and everything every day and, and all day long, but they, they have a lot of memories on their own, and uh, that's, that's pretty impressive. Frank, as we look at a picture of your brother, uh, which we'll have in a moment, why was it so important for you to be here today? Because I know half the family said, we're going to do this privately. I know you had a service for Timmy at St. Ignatius uh, last night, but why did you want to be here? This is where he breathed his last, and this is hallowed ground for us. I mean, it is the site of unspeakable violence, but it's also uh, the site of such heroism. And so that's the reason why, I think, because for us, it will always be where Tim breathed his last. I know that, Dennis, you worked at Eurobrokers. You still work at Eurobrokers. Uh, at the time, your office was located on the 84th floor of, of the South Tower. You went through the attack on the World Trade Center in 1993. And despite the fact that an announcement had come over the loudspeaker saying, return to your desk, after that first plane hit, you said, I'm going to get the heck out of here, didn't you? I think a lot of us who had been there in 93 uh, realized that uh, we were very jumpy to begin with. You could feel some of the reverberation. Although we were in the South Tower, you could feel some of the reverberation from the North Tower. And immediately, all the people, many of the colleagues around me, especially the ones within 93, looked up immediately from their desk. And the first thing you think of is, let's evacuate. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of our other colleagues were in different parts of the room, didn't see the security. A man named Jose Marrero came in and waved us out. Uh, we were close enough to the door to see that. And uh, unfortunately, he was lost, but uh, a lot of us made the decision to move quickly. Unfortunately, a lot of my colleagues did not. 61 yeah. employees were lost. I imagine you've been having a hard time wondering, why my brother, why not me, since you all worked in the same building? That must be very difficult for well, you. Well, we've been through so much in the last year. I mean, with my colleagues and with, uh, and with Timmy, especially thinking about them. I really don't think about that too much. I think about the fact that all that we can be thankful for. And, uh, you know, you, you take nothing for granted anymore. Uh, one, one day, Timmy was here on September 10th, living a, a beautiful life, and, and the next day he was gone. And I, I think you have to accentu accentuate that. that you don't know what tomorrow will bring. We'll live today to the fullest and, and love one another. Do you agree with Christy Ferrer that uh, you'll be glad when this day is over that the healing process can really begin perhaps tomorrow? Uh, well, I have to say I am looking forward to tomorrow. Um, I think the, the healing process 
it just continues. Um, I feel like I've been healing since last September 11th, and um, I, I was a little nervous about this day, and yet I think it's necessary and it's important that everybody remembers, and uh, I can get through it. And 25 families in Manhasset are going through the same thing that you all have. Thank you all so much for for being here, Maura and, sure. and Dennis and Frank. It's good to see you all. Thank you. Thank good you. luck today. Thank you. Matt, back to you. Katie, thank you. During the past year, many Americans have struggled with trying to make some kind of sense out of the events of September 11th, questioning their faith and, of course, their spirituality. One person who's tried to address these issues in depth is Cardinal Edward Egan, the leader of the Archdiocese of New York. Your Eminence, good morning. Thanks for being here. Good morning, Matt. It's a pleasure to be here. I, I know people have turned to the church, to their religious leaders, with a lot of questions over these past 12 months. What questions have you heard most often? Well, the question that I think so many ask, of course, is how in the world could Providence allow such a thing to happen? But you know, Matt, we have seen here in New York such demonstrations of selflessness and goodness and compassion that I think that one answer we can give is that we've had a lesson of true goodness and even, I would say, holiness here in this wonderful town of ours over the last year. I've seen heroism such as I never expected to see. When I leave the mayor's celebration this morning, I'll be going over to St. Peter's Church, which is one closest to ground zero. And I want to tell you, Matt, that the priests and the people of that parish have been absolutely heroes. They have fed and taken care of and run the email and provided the cots and everything for right. hundreds and hundreds all the way until the end of this past May. So, Matt, I would say that in the midst of all of this horror, I, at least, and many others, have been truly inspired by the goodness we've seen. And I think the Lord has been working in that regard. You know, people obviously say, where was God, Cardinal Egan, on September 11th? And, and they also have a question, how could people have done this, committed these horrific acts in the name of their own God? Well, I don't know for sure, Matt, if that's the reason they did it. But if they did it, they're, of course, completely out of line. But let me tell you, I saw God here. I was standing in front of St. Vincent's Hospital when the second building came down. I was walking through ground zero for the days afterwards. And I want to tell you that I saw the Lord in his people. I saw people who, Matt, were willing to walk into harm's way for others and ask nothing but to serve and nothing but to save. So I assure you that God was there. God was there inspiring the wonderful firefighters, police officers, emergency workers, health care professionals. Matt, one day I'm going to write a book if I ever can get retired and get a little time and describe what I saw. And let me assure you, the Lord was with every one of us. You are not only a religious leader in this city, you're now a New Yorker. I know you're from Chicago originally, but as a New Yorker, someone who lives very close to St. Patrick's Cathedral, have you been afraid in this last you year, Cardinal Egan? Not for one minute. And this all town is safe because this town is being protected by the greatest police department in the world, a fire department of men who are the most dedicated and women who are the most dedicated that you can imagine. Yesterday morning I was at the funeral of Mayor Giuliani's dear mother, and I think you know the heroism and the importance he gave to the protection of this town, and my good friend Mayor Bloomberg is doing the same. New York is safe say to all of New York and to all of America, come and visit us. We're safe here, we're well protected, and we're doing just fine. Cardinal Edward Egan, Your Eminence, thank you for your time this morning. I hope you'll come talk to me in the near future. Thanks, Matt. It's great to see you always. All right, and we should mention, according to a recent poll, 77% of Americans say they will pray on this September 11th. We're back right after this. Katie, a year ago at this moment, hijacker Mohammed Atta placed a cell phone call to hijacker Marwan al Shahi aboard United Airlines Flight 175 to confirm that both Boston flights were boarded successfully. We'll be back with more after this. Ground Zero. The Pentagon. A field in Shanksville, Pennsylvania. 
This is a special edition of Today America Remembers, September the 11th, 2002. I'm Katie Couric, overlooking at what is now and will forever be known as Ground Zero. Family members of those who lost, family members who lost loved ones, rather, who are gathering for a commemoration which will get underway at 8.46 Eastern Time, marking the moment the first plane hit the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Already bagpipers from all five New York City boroughs are just gathering here at Ground Zero. That's the scene down here at, uh, and I know that you have a timeline of what transpired on this day one year ago. We certainly do, Katie. So much has changed in the last year. At 8.01 last year, Flight 93 was leaving the gate at Newark Airport bound for San Francisco. As we all know, it would never arrive. When we came on the air one year ago today, we were talking about a hero to millions of people, Michael Jordan and his possible return to the NBA. But when that horrible day was over, we had a whole new definition of the word hero. 343 New York City firefighters were killed at the Twin Towers, 23 members of the New York Police Department, 37 Port Authority officers. In just a couple of minutes, we'll look at how security in big cities has changed, particularly here in New York City, Katie. Matt will also remember one of the heroes of September 11th, a man credited with saving hundreds of life, lives before he lost his own when the towers collapsed. We're also going to be talking with Mideast expert Tom Friedman about how far the United States has come when it comes to the war against terrorism. One man who knows about the role of the United States firsthand, Lieutenant General Dan McNeil, commander of U.S. forces in Afghanistan. He's at Bagram Air Base this morning. General McNeil, good morning to you. Thanks sir, very much for joining us. Good morning, Ms. Couric, and good morning to uh, all of the Today Show team from the uh, coalition team here in Afghanistan. Well, thank you. There was a serious assassination attempt, General, I know, on President Karzai last week. There are also reports that suspected al-Qaeda al -Qaeda and Taliban members are re-entering Afghanistan. Are you fearful that once again Afghanistan has become a hotbed for those planning terrorist uh, activities? Afghanistan is a much better place today, Katie, than it was uh, six months ago. It'll be better tomorrow than it is today as long as we continue to do what we're doing, and that is helping the Afghan people get back on their feet. Indeed, I've heard uh, or read the same media reports that you have about al-Qaeda. It's uh, not anything different from what we predicted in June, that we expected to see them come back in smaller numbers, perhaps more often. And uh, we have set our force in such a way, and we've got what we need to continue this fight. We're ready for it. General, how worried are you, though, about internal pressure or internal struggles happening in country with the, the individuals in Afghanistan? In other words, about some of these terrorists once again getting a foothold there. Well, uh, Afghanistan is a country with a 23-, 24-year history of war and totalitarian regimes. Certainly, uh, it would be an unreasonable expectation of us to think that the government will be perfect in its administration within a matter of months. They get better every day, in my view. I'm not a politician. I don't make policy. But just living here, I'm fairly confident they get a little stronger, they get a little better every day. And I think we all ought to have patience. We all ought to continue to help them, especially the international community, which was so generous. Uh, and it uh, offers to donate four and a half billion dollars U.S. Uh, we just need to come forward with those things. Uh, the force that I'm responsible for needs to continue to have the support not only of America but all the countries that are part of the coalition. If we all move forward together, this country will find its ultimate destiny. General McNeil, what about the search for Osama bin Laden? I know that U.S. troops have been focusing lately on the border areas. Can you give us a, reprog a progress report on that? First, they're not uh, solely U.S. troops, it's a coalition force, and, and I do uh, concede that we are working uh, quite a bit in the eastern provinces. We are not solely focused on any personality. There's no compelling evidence to say that uh, Osama is alive. There's none to say he's dead. There are many other leaders of al-Qaeda 
There are many former Taliban leaders that we would have equal interest in, but we're not focused singularly on any one personality. Job one for this force is to close with and destroy, either by capturing or killing what's left of terrorists and those organizations that support terrorists. We'll get it done. And, and in closing, General, how long do you think U.S. forces will be in Afghanistan? I will leave that to Mr. Rumsfeld, General Franks, and, and others who set policy. Uh, I will simply tell you what I've been told. I'm here till the job gets done. As uh, General Schwarzkopf would say, that's decided at a pay grade higher than mine. Lieutenant General Dan McNeil, Commander of U.S. Forces in Afghanistan. General McNeil, thanks so much for talking with us. We appreciate it. And good luck to you and, and all the men and women who are working for you over there. Thank you so much. And they are great men and women. All right. Now let's go back to Matt in Studio 1A. All right, Katie, thank you. After last year's brutal attack, New York Governor George Pataki called for a complete evaluation of the current security measures for New York State. Then he wanted them improved. He turned to James Kalstrom, the former FBI agent in charge of New York City. James Kalstrom, good morning. Always good to have you good here. Good morning, Matt. But before I talk about what you've learned in the last several months, let me ask you about the state of alert we are under today, the second highest state of alert. Have you heard any information here in New York State that makes you concerned? Well, as we reflect on the, uh, the great loss of uh, a year ago, Matt, uh, it's, it's good to remind everybody we are, we are at war. I mean, it's as serious as World War II, as serious as the Cold War. There's no specific information relative to New York, but Al-Qaeda is operational worldwide. Uh, the prudent thing to do uh, because of some of the intelligence that's been collected uh, recently and as uh, recent as yesterday, uh, was to move to a, a new level of alert. And as that, as we are in that new level of alert, have you taken specific actions to upgrade security for this particular day? Well, the city has been at orange alert uh, for a number of months now and uh, pretty much is maxed out from a security standpoint. Uh, the state now, yesterday, moved to that new level of alert. We trained for that. We, uh, we programmed ourselves for that, so we moved to that yesterday. When you, when you took this job, you looked at the entire system of security in New York State, and you made, I believe, about 100 recommendations to the governor. What's your number one recommendation? What needs to be changed most? The most important thing, uh, the governor has provided great leadership on this point, is to stop the next attack. Uh, I think the two important things there are intelligence and equipping state and local law enforcement with better relevant information, education, uh, and access to information in Washington. When you talk about stopping the attacks, though, isn't one of the lessons we learned from September 11th that a, a trained terrorist who is willing to give up his or her own life in committing an act of terror is very difficult to stop? Matt, it's very, very difficult, but uh, we're never going to stop trying to stop it. I mean, we're always going to go to the max to try to stop that thing, and we can do it. Uh, we're better than they are. We can do it, and we're determined to do it. One of the recommendations you made is you want mandatory criminal background checks for anyone who's going to be working at an airport. Will we see that happen? Well, we think that's really uh, something that needs to happen. I mean, when you go through security at the airports, the people on the other side, and I'm sure 99.99 .99 or maybe 100 percent of them close to that are, are great people that are just there for a job. But we don't know who they are. They're not subject to background investigations. We don't know who's working on the, in the sterile area at the airports, and that needs to change. And as you talk about gathering intelligence, and that's so important, as you just said, are we doing enough? Are we concentrating in the right areas to get the kind of intelligence we need to prevent a future 9-11? Well, you know, in the last 20 years, we've created a very risk-adverse intelligence agency, the FBI, law enforcement. We need to change that. These agencies run on their fuel, their jet fuel is morale. You know, we need to get out of this zero defects mentality, and we're doing that. And we need to work much closer together. We need to have better intelligence around the world, and we're moving there. It takes a while to get there, but we're on our way. You were in charge of the FBI in New York City in 1993 when the World Trade Center was bombed. The buildings, of course, stood, as we all know then. Did we do enough to take Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda and the threat of terror attacks here in New York City seriously enough? between 1993 and 2000. Well, there were a number of people that took it very seriously, but I think collectively as a nation, uh, we didn't take it seriously enough, and there's enough blame to go around on that, but certainly this war has been going on at least since 93. I mean, look at the events of the Trade Center, the Manila Air Conspiracy to blow up airliners, the Blind Shake Conspiracy to blow up the tunnels in the UN and the FBI building, the embassy bombings, the bombings of, in Saudi Arabia by barracks, and the USS Cole. So this war has been going on for a long time, Matt. James Kalstrom, always good to have you here.
Nice to be with you. It's 10 after the hour. Here's Katie. All right, Matt, thank you so much. You know, it's still hard to believe that more than 2,800 people lost their lives one year ago today here at the site of the World Trade Center. One of them was a man named Rick Rescorla. He was a Vietnam veteran who many say saved hundreds of lives on September 11th. But shortly after going back into the World Trade Center to rescue others, to double check that no one was still in there, Tower 2 collapsed and Rick never came out. His remarkable story and that of his best friend, Dan Hill, an American Muslim who fought in Afghanistan, is now told in a new book called Heart of a Soldier. It was written by Pulitzer Prize winning author James Stewart, who spent countless hours with Rick's widow, Susan. Susan Rescorla and Jim Stewart, good morning. Thanks so much for being here. Good morning, Kate. Nice to see you both. I know that your husband was head of security for Morgan Stanley. And uh, that was the largest employer at the World Trade Center. He's credited with saving hundreds of lives. I mean, there were many heroes that day, but certainly he should be always on that list. I know that you've dealt with sort of heartache about, on one hand, you, you celebrate that your husband was a hero. On the other hand, you mourn the fact that he left you alone. That's correct, yeah. How do you sort of square those two feelings? Um, you, eventually, you eventually come to a point in time where I accept, first of all, I'm so proud of him. I'm so proud of what he did that day. And um, he was my hero before 9-11. He was a warrior. He was doing his job. And, um, you know, I know why he went. I know why he went the way he did. And I just was upset in the beginning to think, well, why was I left? But I know what my, you know, my, I have a different mission. I have a new mission, and that is to not let people forget not only what happened to Rick, but what happened to America. In fact, we have a photo of Rick taken last year as he was helping everyone out of the World Trade Center. Yes. He called you shortly after that first plane That's crashed into the building. What did he say? He said to me, stop crying. He said, um, I have to get everybody out of the building, and I want you to know if something happens to me that you made my life. And that was the last time you heard from him. And then him. I say, you made my life, too, and the phone went dead. And then I kept watching the television, and then the building came down. Did you know right away? Yes. I knew when he spoke to me that he was not, I would never see him again, but just from the way he spoke to me. Jim, Rick was an amazing human being prior to September 11th. He had such a rich and interesting life, almost something out of a spy novel. Absolutely. I mean, I, I really find it an epic story. And his life was entwined with such, so many great historical events, British colonialism in Africa, the Vietnam War, the protests on American campuses, the financial centers. And he was there in the 93 bombing. He loved the books of Rudyard Kipling and Joseph Conrad. He, he could have been a character in one of those novels. I think it's so interesting looking back on your career as a writer. You've written a lot about the lack of integrity in corporate America, the lack of integrity in your view in, in the American political system. This story could not be further from those. I mean, you're talking about a story of honor, integrity, doing the right thing. There are thousands of stories like this or, you know, thousands of, of victims who led pretty remarkable lives, maybe not quite as exciting as your husband. Why, I'm curious, did you choose this one? Well, Katie, I think we all changed because of September 11th, and I felt compelled to write this story. I've never felt anything like it in my life. And yes, it's the opposite of the kind of behavior I wrote about before, the worst in human nature. And here was a story in crystal clarity that showed the greatest and the best and the most noble in human nature in Rick Viscorla, and I had to tell that story. And the, at the core, it is a love story, isn't it? Absolutely. I mean, he had a full and and wonderful life, and largely, I think he would say, because of this great love and romance he found with Susan towards the end of his life, but thank God he found it because it completed his life and they made each other whole, as Susan has said so many times. How did you meet? <laughs> Actually, we were living in the same uh, townhouse complex and he was uh, jogging barefoot and I was walking my dog and he went by and I just said, why are you jogging in barefoot? And he said, I'm writing a book about Rhodesia and I wanted to know how it felt. To, you know, to, to walk with no shoes on. And you must have thought, gosh, this, this guy could be pretty interesting. I thought from the moment, yes. <laughs> and of course, this great love of your life came late, later in your life right. for you, which was a wonderful surprise and enriched your life, yes. life so much and, and his life as well. Yeah. This also is a book about friendship. 
tell me about this one individual. So fascinating because it really is sort of emblematic of the whole of a different chapter in this tragedy, isn't it, Jim? Well, Rick met his best friend Dan Hill in the in the remote corner of Africa in the early 60s with politics and intrigue and war swirling around them. And they forged a friendship that maybe only two soldiers can who have saved each other's lives. I mean, Rick grabbed helicopters and came to Dan's rescue on an isolated hilltop in Vietnam. And yet, I have to say, I envy this friendship. I don't have a friendship like this in my life. It was so close. It was so intense. I think it shows Rick's huge heart, which is partly why it's heart of a soldier, not only for the woman that he loved, but this great capacity for friendship, a very deep and inspiring relationship. And I this, think. this friend of his, Dan Hill, yes. converted to Islam. Amazingly. I mean, you know, fact stranger than fiction. Twist. He had parachuted into Lebanon in a U.S. operation in 1958 where he first met Muslims. He became interested and later in life he did con convert to Islam, which enabled him, first of all, he speaks fluent Arabic, and secondly, after the 93 bombing, he went to various mosques in the New York area and he came back to Rick and he said, you know, they're not giving up. There is virulent anti-Americanism and hatred in this community. These uh, buildings are going to remain a target. And they started calling the World Trade Center Ground Zero. 1993. But nobody really listened to No they? one wanted to hear that. No one. We went into denial. America went into denial. The Port Authority went into denial. And we saw that we reaped the consequences. Meanwhile, I know that your husband often wrote and thought about writing a book, a book called Heart of a Soldier. And That's one right. of the things he jotted down shortly before he died was heroic, heroic acts tend to gather around soldiers, perhaps stirred up on the cries for patriotic duty. They're so relevant, those words, aren't they? Exactly. And it was just so wonderful that I found these notes, uh, you know, that he had written in the night, the months before this all happened. And I knew, as soon as I found them, that, that I wanted to write the book that he, he wanted to write. He, you know, he, his, his job was security, but his passion was words and writing. And so we just looked forward to his retiring so that he could write. And so this, to me, is the greatest gift I could have given him. Wow. He sounds as if he was an absolutely remarkable man. And Jim, this is a remarkable book. Congratulations on capturing not only love and friendship, but true heroism. It's called Heart of a Soldier. Jim Stewart and Susan Rescorla, thank you so much and, and all you, the best Katie. to you today. Thank you so much for having us on the show. Thank and you. now back to Matt. All right, Katie, thank you. We've made mention of where President Bush and Mrs. Bush will be throughout this day. We've forgotten to mention that Vice President Nick Cheney is now in a undisclosed secure location, similar to the way he was taken to one of those locations after September 11th a year ago. Of course, that to preserve the chain of command should something happen on this day. At ceremonies around the world today, the attack on America will be remembered. The more than 3,000 people killed will, of course, be mourned. NBC's Keith Miller is at St. Paul's Cathedral in London, where a memorial service is just getting underway. Keith, who's attending that service? Matt, in fact, the service has just begun, a commemorative service, a service of remembrance uh, for all of the victims, including the 68 British citizens who were killed in the attack on the Twin Towers. Prince Charles is here, along with his son Harry. Uh, Prime Minister Tony Blair is here, along with the U.S. Ambassador. And a special representative from the emergency services in New York. Uh, New York City Police Lieutenant Frank Dwyer is here. He will be lighting the commemorative candle at the moment that the first plane hit the tower one year ago. At that particular moment, Matt, throughout Britain, there'll be two minutes of silence. All the railway stations, uh, airplane terminals, even department stores will stop business, will stop conducting business uh, for two minutes of silence throughout the country. Also, I'd like to tell you the Queen sent a message of condolence to New York City and America today, saying that the events of 9-11 threatened the freedom, innocence, and other values we all hold dear, adding, but they also inspired grace, charity, and courage. It will be a day of mourning, also a day of remembrance, and perhaps a day of hope here in uh, London. Matt? Keith, can you give me an idea of how some other nations are marking this occasion? Well, interesting. It's sort of a rolling, if you will, a rolling uh, uh, commemorative day. It started in Auckland, New Zealand, very early this morning with church services and bells tolling uh, throughout that country. And then it went right across the time zone. We know that the, uh, there'll be a, a requiem sung, the Mozart's re a requiem will be sung in 21 different time zones. That's already started, of course, in New Zealand, going across uh, Australia and through Asia, now entering, of course, into Europe shortly. It will end up in American Samoa, will be the last location 
location uh, commemorating this day worldwide, Matt. All right, Keith Miller in London this morning. Keith, thanks very much. 19 after the hour, once again, here's Katie. Matt, needless to say, September 11th changed the world for all of us, but for one writer, the change meant the collision of two of his strongest and most passionate interests, globalization and the Middle East. Three-time Pulitzer Prize winner Thomas Friedman writes a foreign affairs column for the New York Times. He's the author of several books as well. Tom, good morning. Nice to see you. Great to be with you, Kate. You know, you've written extensively and wonderfully, in my Appreciate view, that. about the, <clears throat> the post-September 11th world. But you also wrote a lot about foreign affairs yeah. prior to September 11th. Should the United States, while well, hindsight's 2020, and this is a case of Monday morning quarterbacking, should the United States have been more aware or more ready for attack of this nature? Well, you know, there's there, no doubt there was a lot of signs. There were a lot of signs beforehand, now looking back. But, you know, I've always felt, Katie, it, it was not a failure of intelligence that really produced uh, September 11. It was a failure of imagination. Um, and in some ways, I'm, I'm glad that we don't have the kind of evil imagination that really would have been required to anticipate this. Do you think the establishment became too complacent in this? You know, they were so busy breathing a sigh of relief in the post-Cold War Absolutely. era. As we can see, President Bush is now leaving church, St. John's Episcopal Church, across from the White House. But do you think that these other global hotspots simply were not on the radar screen. Yeah, look, the 90s were a decade of real silliness. Um, it was a decade preoccupied with Monica Lewinsky, O.J. Simpson, uh, and ultimately Gary Condit on the eve of September 11th. So there's no question we took our eye off the ball as a country and as a society. I know that you have written that in order for the United States or the rest of the world to win the war against terrorism, it'll require more than military muscle. It will require a dramatic and unprecedented effort to change the way the world views the United States and to communicate the positive ideals and values of this country to the world at large. Well, you know, a lot of people have said, why do they hate us? And, and to me, the real question is, why don't they see who we are? And part of that is a transmitter problem. We haven't been uh, as, as effective as we can be in transmitting who we are. You have Al Jazeera broadcasting anti-American messages and exactly. sentiments 24-7. Exactly. And what does the United States have? Well, as I say, that part of that is also though, a receiver problem. It's a receiver problem on their end. If you have a, a society, and, and in, in the Arab Middle East, this is what's going on, that is really struggling with modernization, okay, really uh, in a very frustrating and difficult way, sometimes you can be out there with your message, you know, 24-7, but if people don't want to receive it because they are resentful, because they're angry, because they live in repressive regimes. We could have 10 Al Jazeera's and it wouldn't make a difference. Well, what do you do then? I mean, can't get in the business of nation building in every nation that, that's str struggling with, uh, you know, modern demands uh, of life. Sure. Well, I, I think context really matters, Kate. If there's one thing I've learned in this last year, how people live their lives really matters. You know, people say, boy, Islam's an angry religion. I disagree. I think there are a lot of Muslims who are angry, though, because they are living in repressive anti-democratic, non-democratic societies. You change that, what is religion? It's just a reflection on your daily life. It's, it's a mirror of your, of your circumstances. You change the context within which all those people live, and you will have, a, I think, a very different Islam, and the receivers will be receiving our message in a different way. One year later, Tom, what has the Bush administration done right? What has it done wrong? I think they prosecuted the war in Afghanistan in terms of going after al-Qaeda in a decisive and serious way, um, very effectively. You know, people say uh, violence doesn't solve anything, and, and that isn't always true. I mean, sometimes when there are people out there who want to kill you for who you are, and not just for what you do, um, the only option is violence. But at the same time, um, bin Laden has gotten away, and I feel that in the end of this year, as um, we now have bled into a whole new story of Iraq, we may be losing the focus on, on this threat from al-Qaeda, and that's what I would certainly worry about today. Do you think too much emphasis has been placed on Osama bin Laden as an individual, though, getting him dead or alive? Is he, or do I have we captured him yet? No, I disagree. I think bin Laden is a uniquely dangerous character. He's a bizarre combination of Charles Manson and Jack Welch. That is um, the most sure, key... Yeah, right. really appreciate that. <laughs> I mean, no insult to Mr. Wealth, but he is the most mendacious, evil guy who has the organizational skills of a corporate uh, a Fortune 500 manager. Guys like that don't come along every day, and it's very important to eliminate them. You mentioned Iraq, and I can't let you go without talking to you about that. Tomorrow, the president will speak to the United Nations, laying out his case for Iraq. How do you feel? Should we be concerned about a U.S. attack on Iraq? And 
is this country opening up a Pandora's box, or is, just, is it a necessary um, action when it comes to world security? Well, I, I buy the president's argument that Saddam Hussein is a really bad guy who's mixing really bad stuff in his bathtubs, and the world would be a better place if he were gone. But I think to do Iraq, you got to do it right. That means with a united America and with allies abroad. And that, to me, is going to be the real decisive criteria. And will the allies join in? I think it depends how we approach it. If we go to the UN, make one last diplomatic effort on, on inspection, say, unfettered inspections anywhere, anytime, 24 hours a day, surprise, and Saddam says no, at at least we have a triggering mechanism so before the eyes of the world it's clearly he who has refused the diplomatic route. Tom Friedman of the New York Times, I could stay here and talk with you all morning but unfortunately we have other business to get to. Thanks so much for stopping Pleasure, by this morning. Katie. Great Thank to you. see you as always. Now here's Matt. All right Katie, while some families gather at ceremonies today, others have chosen to spend the day a little differently. The Hickey family in Bethpage, New York will go to church and have dinner with the squad at Rescue 4 in Queens. That's where Brian Hickey was an FDNY captain before he died at the World Trade Center. Back in December, we met Brian's 10-year-old son, Kevin, and recently we returned to the Hickey household to check in on the family and, of course, our friend Kevin. I think he's gaining strength with every day, seeing that he can do this, but uh, still has the broken heart, still the little boy. He was lost without Brian. One year later, the Hickeys are still lost without Brian, but they're recovering, each on their own time. He was the whole package. He was honest. He had integrity like I've never seen in a man. Compassion. He was a hero because he was a devoted husband, father, son, and brother. I want to talk to you a little bit, Kevin, about your dad. OK. We first met Brian's youngest son, 10-year-old Kevin, in December, just three months after his father's death. And he was a, one of the heroes who went to the World Trade Center that day, wasn't he? We asked Kevin if there was something we could do that might ease some of his pain, even for just a couple of hours. His wish? To visit Yankee Stadium and meet some of the players. How you doing? Jason Giambi, buddy. Kevin managed a few smiles that day. He met Jason Giambi, the team's newest star, who, as luck would have it, had just replaced Kevin's favorite player. Who's your favorite Yankee? Tino. <laughs> Just a few months later, Kevin flew to St. Louis to meet Tino. Tino Martinez, that is. His favorite former Yankee, now a Cardinal. But that stadium just wasn't quite like home. It's too much red. Over the last year, the Hickey family allowed us to share moments like these with a home video camera that we provided. Happy Valentine's Day, 2000. School plays. A St. Patrick's Day parade. <laughs> Family vacation, a birthday celebration. 19 Happy years birthday, ago. Dennis. I remember Daddy coming out of the hospital doors in a gown. True. I got a boy! True. <laughs> and a junior prom. Happy moments, but somehow always bittersweet. I put Brian's duffel bag there. That's the one he used to carry every day when he went to work. I just kind of assumed it would go there. Recently, I went back to Long Island to see how Kevin, his mom Donna, and his brothers and sister are doing. Look at this, we have the same haircut. When did that happen? I got one two days ago. Did you? You like it? Just a few months ago, they moved into a new house, the house that Brian and Donna always dreamed of. It's really the Brian dream house in general, isn't yes, it? Yes, the whole thing. The whole thing is the way he wanted it. So I'm building the mansion down here, and he's going to build the mansion up there. That's nice how I'm looking look at, at it. it, you know? That's great. Yeah. Nice. Maybe the uh, simplest question and the most difficult question I can mm -hmm. ask, and what's this last year been like for you? Um, a dream, surreal. You know, it still hasn't. Um, it's just unbelievable. They never found him, and that's made it really, really hard. You're on still all waiting of us. for some kind of DNA evidence. You know, I had a funeral. I buried him on his birthday um, because they did find his helmet, and it was all I was going to get, and I knew that. And it was right. It was, the timing was there. The kids were ready. I was ready. It had been nine months. Your son, Danny, made a speech that day, and he said, my dad's not a hero because of the way he died. He, he was a hero because of the way he lived his life. I was so proud of him at that moment. He always said, you know, just, t just talk from the heart. Always talk from the heart. 
He was a hero because he was kind, generous, and loving. That's the kind of family I've got. <laughs> I'm lucky. I'm How are lucky. the kids doing? Um, they're different. <laughs> they, uh, I'm, just, I'm trying to figure them out. You know, there's no blueprint for this. And um, we're all going to make a lot of mistakes before this is over, if it's ever over. I tried to fill a big hole, is you what I tried them. to do. Oh, overindulged. And it's just recently I'm learning um, that the hole will never be filled. For the three youngest children, Dennis, 19, Jackie, 17, and 10 year old Kevin, some of the most difficult years are just beginning. Years that are tough to face without a father. He was basically the one who was guiding me to do like the right things and try to like set goals for myself, but now I just got to do that on my own. So, I don't know, I'll take a little while to figure it out. You say you knew there'd be bad days and your friends knew there would be bad days. Describe a bad day. You realize that your family's not whole. And like, you look at other people and they have like a happy, like family and, I don't know, just, it's different. Kevin, last time I saw you, um, it was a really difficult time for you. Yep. And tell me how it's gone since then. Well, I've gone over it, and it's not so sad anymore. What do you miss most about him? Everything. <laughs> so he's trying to move on he's in his own way. He's trying to move on in his own way. The only thing that frightens me is um, you don't know where that fine line is because I don't want him to ever forget Brian. I want him to know exactly what kind of father he had. The Hickeys are learning to go on by finding strength in each other. He was the one that held us all together. Now I have to do it. It's very scary. So when you hear people say it's time to get back to normal. I get crazy. It drives I you get nuts. crazy. Because how could you? Don't make that statement because there's too many of us affected that can never go back to the way it was, you know, no matter how hard we try. Are there good days? No. Mm -mm. It's, it's I hard for me to ask, and it's hard to listen to your answer. I don't know if there's ever going to be a good day again. We get through the days. We function. We go through the motions. Um, and I know things change, and I know that there's a lot of things ahead of us that we don't know, and I'm trying to be very positive about that. But the loneliness is incomprehensible. It's, um, it's not anything you can possibly be prepared for. And it doesn't go away. But even though he is no longer here in person, his example lives on. These shoes are very hard to fill. I don't think anybody ever will. But his legacy lives on as we use his life as an example to guide us. Happy birthday, Pop. We want to thank the Hickey family for letting us into their home, and our thoughts and prayers are certainly with them. About 13 minutes from now, America will take part in a moment of silence. That's the time when the president will experience that moment of silence at the White House. That's, of course, when a hijacked plane sliced into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. Bagpipers from all five boroughs of New York have marched to ground zero to form a circle of honor. At the White House, employees are gathering for a moment of silence. You can see there, and in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, people are starting to come together. At the Pentagon, families, military leaders, politicians, all united in mourning. And in Boston this morning at Logan Airport, where two of the planes took off a year ago, there is a vigil. I'm Matt Lauer in Studio 1A. Katie's down at Ground Zero this morning. Katie, an awfully difficult morning for a lot of people. It certainly is, Matt. And as we've noted, many families have chosen to stay away from this morning ceremony here at Ground Zero. Others have been gathering for hours now. If you look below me, there is absolutely a sea of people who are getting ready to participate in what will be a very moving and somber ceremony. As you mentioned, Mayor Bloomberg will call for a moment of silence. Then Governor George Pataki of New York will read the Gettysburg Address. And former New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani will begin the reading 
of 2,801 names of those who died here. Other people who will be reading names include Hillary Rodham Clinton, actor Robert De Niro, Michael Lamonico, who is the chef or was the chef at Windows on the World, who was very lucky to escape with his life that terrible morning, Colin Powell, as well as a cross-section of New Yorkers who lost loved ones in this tragedy. During the ceremony as well, Matt, family members who choose to do so will for the first time actually walk down to the footprints of the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center. They have not per been permitted there until today. They will lay a rose for lo their loved one and the base of roses will be kept and be included in whatever memorial will be here at some point in time. You know, for all the tragedy of September 11th, there were small pieces of triumph. One of them was St. Paul's Chapel, part of Trinity Church, which used to nestle in the shadow of the World Trade Center. This morning, our national correspondent, Jamie Gangel, has a look at this wonderful church and the incredible service that it has done and really been uh, doing for all the rescue workers who tirelessly toiled here following that morning. Jamie? Good morning, Katie. We're standing right in front of the gates here, and it's amazing that the church and chapel survived, but it's also remarkable the extraordinary shelter it provided for volunteers, parishioners, and rescue workers. Built in 1766, a place of prayer, a place of comfort. St. Paul's Chapel and Trinity Church are two of the oldest buildings in New York, sacred historic landmarks. George Washington prayed here. Alexander Hamilton is buried in the graveyard. Just blocks away from the World Trade Center on 9-11, it was a miracle that it survived at all. Why did it stand? Providence. God's divine plan. Those are mysteries that we don't understand and we accept them certainly. At first, the hallowed ground was covered with ash and debris, but within days, the doors reopened. The church went back to work. It was a haven for volunteers and rescue workers, providing round the clock services, a place to get food, care, sleep, a place to look toward heaven. In the years since, Trinity Church has rebuilt its congregation, continued to help the community, and accept its new place in history. Katie, Katie, the church kept up that work for eight months. Today it reopens its doors again. There are going to be special services here, concerts, there's a photo exhibit, all honoring rescue workers and the people of Ground Zero. And as you can see behind me, people from all over the world have come and left tributes on the gates here. It's just covered and it's been very somber here. We're really just across the street. And as we've stood here this morning, Hundreds of family members, firefighters, and police officers have been making their way past the chapel going to Ground Zero. It's been very somber. Katie? Yep. As you say, Jamie, a little piece of hope and salvation amidst the terrible devastation and destruction. Jamie Gengel, Jamie, thank you so much. Thank you, Katie. Now, here's Matt. Thanks. We want to go to the White House in Washington now, where in just a few minutes the president will come out to observe a moment of silence. NBC's Campbell Brown is there this morning. Campbell, good morning. Good morning, Matt. Well, the in, almost the entire White House staff, along with the President and First Lady, are gathering now on the South Lawn to observe that moment of silence at 8.46 a.m. precisely. That was the moment when the first plane hit the World Trade Center. And this is a repeat of a similar moment of silence that was held here at the White House on the South Lawn uh, one week after the attacks. And as you know, so far for the President, it's been a morning mostly of quiet prayer. He attended uh, morning service at St. 
St. John's Church just across from the White House, right next to Lafayette Park. And you may remember seeing pictures of the White House staff running across the park when the White House was evacuated a year ago. And that became sort of a gathering place for staff in those first few hours after all the confusion. And we're not actually going to hear from the president until he speaks a little more than an hour from now at the Pentagon, remembering the victims who died both on the ground and aboard Flight 77. But one thing I think that's interesting, Matt, is his message overall today really hasn't changed that much from what we heard from him a year ago, along with honoring the families and the victims uh, of the attacks on September 11th. There is a real air of defiance to what we're going to hear from the president, both at the Pentagon and then in New York tonight, uh, saying that Americans now have a responsibility to defend freedom, right. to fight for freedom around the world. Matt? Qu quickly, Campbell, if you will, there is always intense security around the president of the United States. But as he moves from the Pentagon to Shanksville to New York today, I would imagine it will be even more severe. Extremely tight security around the president today, and we're even getting a sense for it at the White House right now, where the Secret Service is on heightened alert. As you know, Vice President Dick Cheney now is in an undisclosed location to ensure the continuity of government. Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld even putting... Um, uh, anti-aircraft, live anti-aircraft missiles, deploying them around Washington. Uh, all of this, they say, not in response to specific threats aimed at the U.S., but rather at overseas targets, but no one today taking any chances. All right, NBC's Campbell Brown at the White House this morning. Campbell, thanks very much. 40 after the hour, let's go back to Ground Zero and Katie. All right, Matt, thank you so much. NBC's Tim Russert is our Washington bureau chief as well as moderator of Meet the Press. He's here to reflect on the importance of this National Day of Remembrance. And Tim, you really can't overstate how important this day is for the entire nation, can you? You sure can, Katie. I don't think the English language has yet found the words that can describe the pain and the hurt, the sorrow, the anger that we all are experiencing this day. So often we say, gee, how that year flew by, but think about it. It just really does literally seem like yesterday that we experienced and watched our fellow Americans withstand this attack. Uh, it's, it's an extraordinary moment for all of us, and it's going to play out through the entire day. It, it also underscores the importance of ceremony, the importance of things like tolling bells, historical symbols, uh, the, the importance of silence at a time like this. Katie, not only does the country need that, but the families need it. They need to know that their loved ones are remembered, not only by them, but by all of us. They paid the ultimate price for representing what we stand for, and for us not to honor them and to remember them in a very bold and dramatic way would be unforgiving of ourselves. Uh, there is no doubt this is going to cause renewed grief and suffering. But it is something we have to go through and experience if we're going to maintain our resolve and understand who we are in the world and what we have to do to maintain our standing and our own lifestyle. And the president will be making address, an address at the Statue of Liberty tonight. Obviously, he'll be going to the Pentagon as well as the ceremony in Shanksville. How important is his message tonight, particularly as discussion now focuses on the possibility of an, uh, of an invasion on Iraq? Well, you've described it exactly right, Katie. He not only is commander-in-chief, but he is healer-in-chief. Two very difficult and delicate and perhaps even sometimes contradictory roles, but he must fulfill them. You know, President Bush often remarks that the Bushmen, his father, his brothers, are emotional and sometimes show tears. I have no doubt we'll see some of that today. On the other hand, we'll also see a steely resolve in the war against terrorism as it expands now to Iraq. Might this make... Uh the problem uh, of the whole debate about Iraq a little more problematic for the White House with uh, the war against terrorism still being fought in Afghanistan? I think that issue is going to be raised. Can the innate, a nation, in fact, have a two-front war? Will one detract from another? Is the job in Afghanistan finished? Is Osama bin Laden, Osama bin Laden alive or dead? That was a central part of the debate. But I think more of the focus will be today on September 11th and those we lost one year ago. Tim Russert in Washington. Tim, thank you very much. Matt? Katie, we are listening to the bagpipers now who have created a circle of honor down by you at Ground Zero. They are going to be playing until this nation observes a moment of silence about two minutes from right now. Of course, the time when Flight 11 sliced into the North Tower of the World Trade Center one year ago 
today. Let's listen. Again today, we are a nation that mourns. Again today, we take into our hearts and minds those who perished on this site one year ago, and also those who came to toil in the rubble to bring order out of chaos, and those who throughout these 12 months have struggled to help us make sense of our despair. Now we join with our fellow Americans in a minute of silence, led by President George W. Bush from the South Lawn of the White House in Washington. and 39 years ago, President Abraham Lincoln looked out at his wounded nation as he stood on a once beautiful field that had become its saddest and largest burial ground. Then it was Gettysburg. Today it is the World Trade Center, where we gather on native soil to share our common grief. Governor George E. Pataki. Thank you, Mayor Bloomberg. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that the nation might live. 
It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it far beyond our poor powers to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. It is, rather, for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. They were our neighbors, our husbands, our children, our sisters, our brothers, and our wives. They were our countrymen and our friends. They were us.